Thanks everybody for attending. This panel is here to talk about when's a breach, not a breach, or when is a breach, a breach. We get to know the audience a little bit better, or our panelists, so maybe you could give me a show of hands. How many people are in the legal profession? Lawyers? Work with lawyers? How many people are incident responders? Yeah, okay, several people. And how many people have been involved in a breach or worked with a breach directly? All right, great. Well, let's have the panelists introduce themselves. We'll start at the far end there. Ray, you want to go ahead? Oh, great. Um, my name is Ray Emerly. I'm one of the least recognized on this panel. Um, I'm the Chief Data Protection Officer for a Fortune 500. Uh, what that means, it sounds really sexy. It's really not. Um, I have three primary responsibilities. One is security privacy by design during the product life cycle, so making sure we're making those in. Um, the other is awareness and communication within the organization. And the last, and probably the most relevant to this panel, is I handle and lead our incident response or breach response as it relates to the So US as well as EU, Asian PAC, et cetera. How do we respond to that? How do we classify a breach? How do we do notifications? So I'm uh, Jack Daniel, and I am uh, one of the founders of the B-Sides movement. Um, relevant to this, uh, several years ago in Massachusetts, the TJX uh, breach finally pushed our stalled uh, breach notification law through uh, 93H, and uh, it actually went farther than most because it specified that we had to have uh, regulations to prevent the breach, which is the infamous 201 CMR 17, which I became heavily involved in because I read two short articles that were written by people who had not read all four pages of the initial draft. So uh, somebody was wrong on the internet, and and I have spent years uh, involved in, in breach disclosure, breach law, uh, and that have not ex extrica extricated myself from it. Plus, having had to deal with a few small things and when I'm back when I worked for a living. Now I'm in vendor land, so. Thanks, Jack. I'm Steve Worthy. I'm currently a security architect at a Fortune 200. I do security research outside of my day job. Previously, I, I'd worked as a CISO for three different organizations, each of which uh, I was involved in uh, reportable data breaches. So I have a lot of experience with data breach notifications and the laws around those, both in the states of Texas and Virginia. I'm David Mortman. I'm a former CISO, uh, recovering CISO, if you will. Um, never again, I always say. Um, I'm currently a chief security architect at a large hardware and software vendor you've all heard of, and uh, as a result, uh, anything that might be breach related to the product that I work on, I have to work on the big breach stuff one way or another for the last, this is ever, since CA 1386 came out, which was 2004-ish, something like that. All right, awesome. My name is Davi Ottenheimer, so I'm volunteering to moderate this crazy panel. So I guess one of my first questions is going to be to the, the group, and I'll let you decide who answers first, but if you remember the Octomom scandal, you know, her information got breached. And if I remember correctly, nobody actually saw the data. The hospital just said that they discovered someone was trying to look at her records and they, because they saw someone trying to look at the records, were fined for having a breach. Does this constitute a breach when someone gets caught trying to look at records of someone who's famous? Okay. Ooh, ooh, me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting because you brought the EPHI example. Yeah. Uh, electronic personal health information, uh, which is probably the, when you talk about breach notifications, the patchiest of subjects, because it's one of those, if you need to land sideways at personal health information, it's, it's you have to report it. You know? um, I think the interesting thing is, is most state breach notification laws, for those of you who don't know, we'll just focus on the US because EU gets really more complicated. There's 46 states that have a data breach notification law. They're all different. There's four that don't, Alabama, Kentucky, North Dakota, one of the Dakotas, and then New Mexico. But all the others have it, some sort of breach notification. Most of them, though, say that there's a, you know, there's a clause in there that says you have to have a reasonable assumption that the data's been accessed or, you know, whatever, unless it comes into BPHI, and then that goes into the, yes, you know, if they even think about looking at it, it is breach. So that's an exception to the rule. In most cases, if you don't have a reasonable assumption that there's no access, then you don't have what about possession? So I think the example we had was somebody gets a laptop with sensitive data on it, they get hit by a bus, never look at it. Is this still a breach, Jack? Well, 
this one's tricky, and this one played this part of this part of this came from uh, the way the Attorney General's Office in Massachusetts interprets uh, 93H and 201 CMR 17, which require these things to be encrypted. And their um, expectation, either their assumption is that it's not that nothing has been properly encrypted, and therefore there's no safe harbor for encryption. And I'm really torn on this because being a pedantic security asshole, which I realize is a redundant phrase, um, <clears throat> I'm completely there because the past phrase is taped to the lid, right? So we've all seen that. And therefore, as soon as you lose control, I have no faith. And there's no way to prove that it hasn't been accessed. But having worked with, so that's, out of control, you know, it's out of control. It makes me crazy, but in the real world where we deal with real people, I would much rather have much more relaxed interpretations because we need to give people a reason to move a little bit forward. So I know I'm straddling the fence here, but the, the state interpretation, the Commonwealth interpretation of Massachusetts is if you lose control of something, encrypted, unencrypted, it doesn't matter, um, unless you have some way to prove it wasn't accessed. That's interesting because in California, of course, it's the opposite. Encryption is like a safe harbor. Right. Steve, you identified yourself as an architect. Can we build safe enough so that they'll leave us alone? Um, I, I don't know if that's possible or not. I, you know, there's no such thing as 100% security. What I think is interesting is that in this example, though, uh, that led to this panel was a scenario where somebody takes a laptop, almost immediately is hit by a bus, and the laptop's destroyed. So we have very high assurance that the data was not accessed. And regardless of what the law has to say, my opinion is that should not be a recordable data breach because the affected individuals never had their data accessed by somebody who's unauthorized. So one quick comment to build on that. I think it's important, you know, that is a breach of security. It's not necessarily a breach of data. And a lot of times we commingle that. So if something happens and it's like, oh, we have a security incident and we all work automatically to certain things data breach. Um, that's a, a distinction that I don't think is, is heavily weighed in many organizations that kind of treat everything almost as a single umbrella. But I'm actually surprised that the 46 states that have data breach laws are very prescriptive about what constitutes a security breach. And both that, you know, is it unencrypted data? Is it uh, encrypted data, but the key has been compromised? Those kind of things. So this is why the question about how many of you deal with law and legal, I, I report to the general counsel in my organization, which has been a learning experience for me. Um, but the interesting thing is that interpretation drives the hearts and minds of your organization. Because that's going to be what your penalties are going to be, whether or not you're going to disclose and the ethics behind it. So if you don't know somebody in the legal profession or you don't deal with them on a regular basis and you're handling data breach instance, find somebody. Talk to somebody. And there's some good sites out there we can talk to them later. All right, Dave. So you're a recovering CIO. So maybe you can be frank with us. Tell us what it's really like. But what's the point of reporting breaches? Does it help when you get these re breaches reported? You can change your policies? You know, you'll... And you know, I think that the the goal of many of these laws, uh, having talked to folks in a lot of states who are in the process of building these laws, is to give customers transparency into what may have happened to their data, so that people could choose to go, you know, engage in a credit reporting service or just monitor their health records. Call the, you know, if the physician lost it, you know, lost the records, understand how they got lost. So you can say, was it, you know, not necessarily for the purpose of suing, but like. If my doctor is, you know, lost their files because, well, I lost my records because they left their filing cabinet and front door unlocked. That doesn't give me a great comfort about their general skills as, you know, as a business person, as a physician, so I might wanna make some choices about that. On the other hand, you know, if it was, you know, the laptop was encrypted and, you know, someone broke into their house and cracked the safe it was in. I'm like, okay, this person's trying really hard, but I still wanna, might wanna be monitoring other things going on and start looking for, you know, my, watch my insurance reports come in and make sure there's not suddenly like medications being ordered in my name or something like that. So, and I think it's more about transparency than, than anything else. I mean, certainly most of these laws have the ability for a class action lawsuit against organizations. Um, and that's really where the safe harbor comes in. It is, so like Indiana, for instance, um, if the data is encrypted and, and the key is not with the data, there's safe harbor. But that situation like where you know, the passphrase is written on the box of tapes, or uh, the secure ID token is in the laptop bag, then you have to, you know, and therefore someone who has it can then, you know, unencrypt the laptop. 
Well, the developers are notorious for putting the key next to the encrypted files. So right. Easy to but, and, right. And if you're dealing with like servers that need to auto boot, you end up in logical loop problems about how do you manage that automatically without, and without lots of software added on. You just can't do that. So either you have no passphrase on your key. All right, let's, take, right there. let's take transparency for a second, though. So it's about the people. I mean, like California, we have a, a five, uh, I believe it's a five day notice now window because people need to know as soon as possible that their information has been breached. But do we really care? I mean, okay, we have to care that people need to know their information has been breached. But isn't the purpose, if we look at like the airline industry, to really know what went wrong so we don't have planes flying around that are about to crash? So is the point of the breach notification really about the victims or is it about protecting them? Well, in my opinion, yeah. I mean, so one of the nice so for the state laws it started as a transparency victim protection thing. If you look at high tech, which is the recent update to HIPAA a couple years ago, one of the things that was mandated as part of that is notification of the ways things were breached to a central authority. Yeah. And then you start getting into usable information like the NTSB gathers for the airlines. So that way you can start as carriers of this data, you can start understanding the ways in which other people are breached and you can be more effective. Is it weird that they require more than five hundred to be the watermark? Well, not, so this, I'm, I'm going to differ a little bit on the, on the consumer protection aspect of it. And the reason I say that is because if you look at most of the notification laws, the, the notification of the Attorney General or the broader disclosure, none of the triggers are the same. Some are automatic, some are before notification, some are after notification. In fact, the notification event is what triggers the action. Some are 500 records, some are 1,000 records. There's an inconsistency there. The other thing is, is if you look at the states, the statutes on the states and how many actually have a private right to action, go back to your class action lawsuits, 30 of those states have no private right to action. So if you actually come forth with a data breach, 30 states will not allow a civil case for class action because your data was compromised. And only 25 of them are even prescriptive in any sort of, you know, $500 per record or anything like that. Most of them don't even, you know, 50% don't even have that. Um, so I think a lot of it is more about, to your point, if it's a specific agency for a specific type of data, that kind of thing is more of protecting the industry itself, and the consumer is almost second, second in the process. So if protecting the industry is an excellent point. Are we really seeing harm of the consumers? Can they prove that they've been harmed when their data's been breached? Well, I, I don't know that they can, and the kind of things we're talking about in terms of the action they would take, in my opinion, are the kinds of things they should be doing anyway. Everyone should be reviewing their credit reports, monitoring their, their financial records, Individuals are seeing so many data breaches involving their data that I believe they're becoming quite numb to it. And so I don't know that incrementally they are doing or should be doing anything differently if they get a data breach notification letter versus if they did not. Wouldn't it all, or doesn't it also function as a punishment against an organization that allows the data breach to happen? It depends on the level of exposure. Right. So in some cases, you're going to have a penalty depending on the type of data. In most cases, are going to, those are going to be capped. For a large, large organization, if it's capped like $50,000 and that's the maximum penalty that you can pay out, that's not a lot, right? Um, the other thing is, is you know, then you look at brand reputation. So I think if you, Ponymon has the statistics, I think the average cost of the organization in the U.S. is five and a half million, not counting the outliers, three million lost business and that kind of thing. For most of the large brands that are already established, you know, they already have a kind of captive audience. It's not like you're going to suddenly care if you're at American Express card if you get a thing saying your card might be compromised. Or they can they can handle it in a different way through a different sales channel and, and, and recover. I think that's the that's the issue is the consumers are becoming desensitized, but organizations are becoming more desensitized unless they stand to lose a lot. Like you know, if it's an online startup and all you have is your reputation, you're screwed. But Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 200 companies, probably not. You're going to pick up, move on. Send out a few checks. Well, let's go back to the definition of a breach. So, if the cost of responding to a breach is significant, and the reputational risk, and the damage, I mean, how much is this really about the definition? So, are people trying really hard to avoid being exposed, avoid being found to violation of? Oh yes, yeah. So, what are they doing to avoid breaches? Are they actually fixing their systems, or are they trying to find ways that they don't have to report breaches? So, they've probably got to figure this too, but. Um, I, I think it's a comp some people are actually trying to fix their systems. Now, I don't want to think like evil corporations are all out there all trying to get each other. You know, my company, my role, a lot of it is making sure we're building in the right controls from the start of the process. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, I think what's what's interesting about this though is there's just not enough compelling reason, and you get stuck in the legal definition. Most of the exceptions that we talk about, safe harbor, they're not actually called out in the law itself or in notification. It's called out in the definition of security breaches. So you start to split the language up, and then it becomes a 
well, what is our viability? Well, it's all based on a few words in this definition, and we can fight that. And anybody and remember what the cost of the breach was for South Carolina, the main investigation? Mm -hmm. How much did that cost? A lot, but yeah, $35 million. The breach cost $35 million? All the estimates cost added up together. I got a, press, I got a slide in. $35 million? Yeah, they were estimated another $7 million of external costs that occur after the $25 million that they already had spent up to the point of releasing. And what was the cost of avoiding that breach? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Nobody has data on that. Weren't they trying to hire a CIO or a CISO or something? Wasn't that the, they couldn't fill a position that was a security officer? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that was one of those after the fact uh, ones that, that came up. You know, some people who were in technology and IT in the state had a very different view of what happened. And that's the, I forget the exact quote, but uh, the governor made some fantastic quips about how hard it is to all right, so another, Basically, she said math is hard, is pretty yeah. much what she said <laughs> about, about crypto. Uh, she said nobody actually, you would, you'd be amazed who doesn't encrypt social security numbers. Nobody does because like, math is hard. Um, did the state a great reputation. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Let me give you another example. I had somebody a question. Okay. Because I'm the poor unfortunate bastard that found a large state of the state of Texas. The amount of money that our state spent just to basically portray uh, we're doing something, I've done something about it. In fact, the public record, in South Carolina's case, everybody has to see the data. Texas, not as so much. Nobody really knows how much our Texas has cost. I do, but not many people do. Uh, the reality is, Would you like to no share? improvement in security. How much, did, how much did it cost? Around 25. Wait, how much? It was two and a half million just to send out the notification, which uh, under Texas law requires uh, web notification only. But our Compass Controller decided that we're going to send a letter to every person to outsource that. Yeah, notification's a huge cost. And sometimes you can do it through public channels. Lost records, that was going to have to be in that. So I want to focus, focus back on the definition, though. So let me give you another example. One of the largest breaches in history, apparently, was from the VA. Yeah. And the VA said that they had lost a RAID disk, one disk. When they sent it back for OEM repair or something, no one could account for where it went. And it was part of an Oracle database. So when you have a disk that has, you know, just a piece of an entire puzzle, and it's a piece of an Oracle database. Is this a breach because they lost that piece of their environment? No one can really reconstruct the data, potentially. Maybe. Yeah, I think it depends on what was actually on the list. So you know, that gets back to, because definition is what we're talking about. It, is that a... It's encoded. Is that a breach of data? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, it, did somebody, can somebody get data from that, of value? No, that doesn't matter. The legal definition is actually what matters, right? Because we can, you know, we can argue about what, when we actually lose control, but we're up against the legal definition. And if the legal definition isn't clear enough, and, and you know, thankfully all laws are written clearly in plain English <laughs> by people who are subject matter experts, <laughs> unbiased, hey, unbiased to uh, not beholden to their wife's business or uh, lobbyists. Well, well, right. they, yeah. 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 One thing to build on that real quick. One, one it's the things English. It's not actually your normal English. Um, but I think it's, it's funny because the definition of personal information. There's um, a commonality across the, the the 46 states that have that. Um, but usually that commonality stops at first name, first initial, and last name in a combination of like some identifier, right? So that's how you identify data. And one element by itself is not enough. Um, but then you start getting into all the exceptions at the different state levels of the, now we are expanding the definition, and so that's around the API note. It's almost impossible to stay up on top of what is personal information anymore. The right. scope is expanded so greatly that it's almost better to just say encrypt the fuck out of everything and just assume it's all personal information. Let's do a quick survey then. Uh I believe Canada, the privacy commissioner there, said email is part of your yeah. sensitive information. I can you address sometimes? Yeah, can you recall it? So how many people agree? Email, private, sensitive information? NSA. <laughs> what, three people? Come on. How many people wish it were, but no, it's not. So let me update that example, right? So you have the RAID drive, and you have the Oracle database, and this was an old example. Some people call it the largest breach in history. Some people say it's not a breach. What about in these new environments? 40,000 clusters or nodes in a Hadoop environment, one of them disappears, it has some P 
piece of data that was sent to it so it can do some processing in parallel. Is that a breach? Because it, 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 well, so to, to reiterate something you said earlier, um, the DBIR is misinterpreted year after year after year. And this year they made a big effort to try to reduce that. But they also, this year, talked to me. They focus on, we know something got away, not we lost a laptop again. So they segregate those two out, and that, that's what we're talking about here. Is, yeah. Did it really get breached, or did we just we not have the control, right? And so, I mean, that, that's like where the insider threat, if you look at the big, the insider threat is devastating. DBIR says, but the ones that we know that somebody got our stuff, that's about it's around the here. Um, this is the difference between like I misplaced my keys and someone stole my car. Right, right, right. So that's a couple of weeks right before hopping in the car to drive out here. I just stopped at Home Depot to grab a couple of things and um, dropped my credit card. And I was like, uh, it's Home Depot, and looking at the sketchy people at Home Depot. And so I called the credit card company, and it was used within ten minutes. Right. So I. And Home Depot is one of those where they, they, they'll, they'll take the risk of no signature up to about 75 bucks or something. Uh, so, it, but you know, they, they got reversed, the, the bank took care of it for me. But there's, the, there's the, what we're talking about. I, oh no, I don't know where my credit card is. I've rifled the truck and all the bags. Shit, where's, where am I? And that's the big undefined. Hello? <laughs> no, I only made one purchase at Home Depot. Now we've got to confirm a breach, but it's not that simple most of the time, right? It's like I, I, we can't call the PLA and say, "Do you have the plans to the next generation of our bone scanner?" Uh, it turns out that they don't answer; they don't speak English, and they, they won't tell us the truth anyway. Oh, they speak English. All right. Well, so I can do the opposite example. This really weird thing happened to me. I found a credit card. And being the good citizen I am, I called up the credit card company on the back and I said, I found this card, probably somebody jogging, dropped it in the park or something. And they made me say my name, they wanted my address, they wanted my phone number, they wanted to like contact me later, call me back. I was like, I don't want to give you anything. Right. I want to tell you I have this card. Do I destroy it? You know, now that you know that it's been lost. And they wanted me to stay on hold. So for half an hour, I sort of argued with them before I was like, okay, I'm destroying the card. You can notify that person that their card wasn't used and you can close the account. But let me go to the... For me, the most troubling example of all, maybe we can get a vote on this, but for, Wait, I'm just, uh, I, I shouldn't be surprised by that, as bitter and jaded as I am, but it's just like, hey, I'm, I'm heading on. off a problem for you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, tear that up. Thank you very much, sir. Click. Right. No, that's, uh, that was what I expected, but it turned out oh. And the fact that they wanted my personal information, I was so tempted to give them the name on the card. And in turn, it's a state for data breach. Right. Well, and, and it, if you expand the example, because I think it's you know, that's small scale, right? But the we go back to new enterprises disclosing breaches is really they should. Yeah. In most cases, they're going to find every nuance as to not to disclose it because of the difficulty of dealing with it after the fact. Because they're looking at okay, the FTC comes involved, and yes, Wyndham's trying to find whether or not FTC actually has authority. But now you get okay. Am I going to get audited for 20 years? You know, what's the penalties? They make it so difficult to be part of that process of, hey, we, you know, we need to address we're compromised, we want to get this information out there to help our consumers, help us get that message. And then it becomes more of a, well, world where we want attribution and punishment. Okay, we're going to lynch you, and that, that's a deterrent for a lot of organizations. Uh, this is where I was going. So in the case of the UCLA breaches, they thought they closed, this is common, of course, the CEO responded back to the regulators, the auditors, I, we took care of the problem, we fired the person who was breaching the data. And then it happened again. Okay, we took care of the problem, we fired the people we think were responsible, and then it happened again. So at what point is breach notification a cause for alarm to really get down to the source of the problem, as opposed to firing some random person or trying to cover it up? Uh, ultimately, that's what led to two new laws in California, because they wanted to be more careful about what they investigate breaches. Well, if you look at the data breaches and what's actually occurring in a lot of cases, somebody inadvertently leaving a laptop in their car in an organization or as a policy against leaving laptops unattended or other things that involve a, a human a human making a mistake or not following the existing administrative policy or technical policy not being put in place 
So I believe it is quite common for someone being made scapegoat in a case like that. But inside the organizations, maybe for a short period of time, there's some additional interest in security awareness and other things to ensure it will never happen again. That's the sort of term that I'm used to hearing. Um, but is that really doing any good? And when we, when we look at it from the standpoint of whether the data is actually a potential risk of being utilized in an unauthorized way, uh, there was a case, TRICARE, it's an insurance company for the government. Uh, so it was in San Antonio while I was living there last year. Somebody parked their car with a backup tape in it two blocks from our house, and someone stole the car or broke into the car. I don't believe they actually broke in to get access to the backup tape. And it's unlikely they're going to utilize that information to cause any harm, but some large number of millions of people have been notified because of that. Did that really make a lot of sense? So, in my, my opinion, we're focusing on the wrong things with these data breach notification laws that we have no control over. We have paper data that I believe in only seven states actually requires data breach notification. It, the laws largely uh, revolve around electronic data. Um, I think if I asked anybody in the room if you'd be upset if an organization exposed your password, you, you probably would be. Uh, question for the rest of the panel, is that a data breach in the United States? Password loss? Password exposure? Just in general, with no other criteria, is that a data breach? So a lot of organizations report it, but is, are they actually required? So how many passwords? Well, like, okay, so 499. Barracuda Labs, right? Or Barracuda had their HD password exposed, right? The guy was Googling around, found HD password. All clear text. Is that a breach? I, from my perspective, I'd say it is. And the reason I said it is because it then enables the access, right? So it's, it's the losing the keys portion. We go back to the unencrypted data where you lost the control mechanism that protects that information. In that case, you've lost the control mechanism. So I would call that a breach if I might say. So, so I, I would not, based on how the data breach notification laws are worded, but it might just be my misunderstanding of them. If it doesn't involve my first initial or first name and last name in combination with social security number or financial information, mm -hmm. if it's my Google email address, which does not have my name in it, is that a data breach? I don't believe it is in most states according to the law, but I'm more uncomfortable having that information compromised than I am my social security number or credit card. As a, as a consumer, I have pretty much zero liability if my credit card's compromised. It'll be a, a nuisance for me because I'll have to get a new card and change it with some organizations that do automatic billing and that type of thing. And I just assume that my social security number has been breached so many times that the important thing for me to do is to monitor my credit periodically and just check for uh, identity fraud involving my identity. Yeah. But there, there are some states, by the way, that are now pushing for electronic IDs to become part of that personal information right there, including email addresses for that very reason. And I think when you look at it from an organization perspective, how many of you work for an organization that does business in one state? So usually what ends up happening is the most arduous condition of the, or definition of personal information is when you have to abide by. So I think more and more organizations are going to have to start taking electronic IDs and other things that are typically viewed as high risk as part of that data breach you know, schema. So if my email address gets compromised and my password gets compromised, it may not be personal information in say Wyoming. By the way, I can't remember Wyoming, it's off the top of my head, so forgive me. But if it is in one state, then I have to send out a notification on those customers if I'm doing business with anybody in that state. So it, 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 it does become kind of a, uh, an effective cycle of the most arduous always wins. Well, that's, less also, that's less a choice point learned. Yeah. 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 Years ago was that choice point got severely breached and they said, we only need to notify in three states, whatever it was. <laughs> they only had to notify in some states, even though they had customers who were compromised in many more states. And they said, the law says right. we need to notify in these states. So that's what they did. And then it became quite clear the breach was much larger and they got raked over the coals by Congress. And you know, there were class action lawsuits, you know, that mostly went away because there was no grounds to sue in those states. But they, it was a valuable lesson in disaster management and business event management. That's right. And the only reason they notified was because they had California customers who required right, it exactly. to take it off. So, I mean, it also could go the other way, right? So people might not want to do business with certain states or have customers. I think people have talked about that they want to have Michigan customers in their databases because of the encryption requirements, right? Michigan, no, no. Massachusetts. Well, I do want but, but it's funny to get some. That actually brings up another important point of clarification, and Jackie may correct me because I know you've been more heavily involved in that, but um, I, I maintain a, a spreadsheet of like all 46 states' laws 
encryption actually, actually is specified is only for encryption of data in transit or on portable devices. Portable devices. There's nothing actually prescriptive like about virtual database. machines yeah. that move around. But there's something prescriptive about database level encryption. If you be motion the virtual machines, uh, mm -hmm. portable. Uh, but as mm -hmm. long as those are transit or public, yeah. it's public, public network. Space. Public yeah. network. Right. PCI and the same way. There's, there's this giant loophole uh, in that which says we're, uh, we're practical or whatever, we're yeah. reasonable. And um, I, I got into a little heated discussion during one of the hearings on it because uh, people kept saying, well, this is fine because people will make a good faith effort. And I finally, I was the only privacy advocate in the room. Everybody else is from the business community. So if the business community had been making a good faith effort, we would not be here right now. Yeah. <clears throat> well, <right. laughs> so the public private space, how was that defined? You know, if you lose a laptop in your parking lot, that's private space. So. But uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and then there's the public, private, so in, in the Commonwealth, the executive branch of government has EO501, the executive order, which is corresponds to 201 CMR17, but other parts of state and municipal government don't have it. So it's possible that an agency can make your day ugly because you had a breach that themselves has no concern for your information as a corporate or personal entity of the state. All right, so here's the most troubling question for me. What about the German argument that any system that has U.S. access is breached because they assume the U.S. government's got super secret spy control? If, I, I, I'm in global health right now since so noted. Because we do, we do global business. We have business in the EU, we have business in Asia Pac and others. And, and now, of course, I think within the last week or two, they're talking about reopening safe harbor you know, to investigate that because it's no longer an insurance of control. And now, now granted, self-assessment has never been a real insurance of anything, other than I'm just telling you like, what I say I'm going to do. Um, but it's becoming more of a challenge doing businesses, doing business in those different countries if you're a US-based entity. Right. So now there's a lot of focus on do we have to put data centers within the foreign nation, keep the data contained. You know, right. Now, of course, you get into issues about no single view of customers. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that go around that. That's the extreme that I think at some point in time, it's going to hurt commerce and other businesses going to have to. Well, you have possession, custody, and control, right? right? So if an American has control of a system, does that constitute a breach? Well, it's, well it's, the, it's not just the, the argument there. And, and I'll, I'll defer to David. My observation on this, because he's an actual cloud expert. I just play one on, I just play one on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's a problem because no one would be stupid enough to store data in the cloud uh, unencrypted or encrypted and trust the cloud service provider with the encryption fees. Nobody would be that dumb. <laughs> right? Please, well, you, dear God. So <laughs> please, dear God. Um, okay, so it depends on your level of skill, right? Uh, it's, well, I think part of the problem is that in a lot of organizations, I, mean, I don't actually have a specific example of proof of someone doing this, but in a lot of organizations, people are like, get handed access to something, and they don't ask where it is. Right. So like, you know, so they, oh, I need a resource, and they, they have not personally launched the service on Amazon, or Rackspace, or Google, or whatever. They just have an application they're using. They have no idea where it is, right. and they shove data into it, or they don't care. So I was talking with the CISO of a very large UK-based pharmaceutical firm, and they discovered that their developers were doing, well, developers, researchers, really, were doing high-end computational modeling of new drugs they were getting ready to put to market on Amazon because they put a request in and IT told them, well, you'll get those computers in six months or three months, whatever it was. And the developers were like, we have deadlines to meet. I have a credit card. So they fired up a bunch of systems, you know, ran their models and took like, you know, six hours or whatever and then shut the systems down. Right. And that wasn't a violation. There was no, you know, confidential information in terms of customers or clients or patients. However, it was just their, you know, their IP for undeveloped drugs that were not yet to market, which is only worth you know, billions of dollars. So he's tearing his hair out. Yeah. So um, perfect example. So Amazon does not wipe your data when you decommission an instance. They only wipe it when you commission an instance. So if you decommission, your data is still sitting there on those servers. Is it a breach when someone else accesses that data? They don't know what it is. They just start accessing an instance without being wiped. What... If it doesn't get wiped properly when it gets into commission, in other words. And, and this is hardly, I mean, this is true for most cloud service providers. They don't wipe the data with volume of commission. Only with provisions, they clean this. Well, Amazon did not uh, label the S3 violation. My partner might have found that uh, roughly about the same time, around seven bit. 
uh, we met with them and explained what it is that could be accessed. And uh, that was, let's just say he was in the process of seeing what he could get. It was quite shocking. Amazon never took that as a data breach, even though we had full access to it. We gave them all the information, Rank 7 gave them all the information. Did they say um, why? Why is that not a breach? They promised to get back to the five days, you can touch base a couple times. Because there are penalties of Probably because it wasn't there. I don't know that too. I also don't think it's necessarily <laughs> so, so this brings so up a very good release that I experienced that myself. Yes. Yeah. So no custody, no control, no possession. Well, exactly. So this this goes back to unauthorized cloud providers. And a lot of you are going to sit here and, and if I ask how many of you have unauthorized cloud running in your organizations? Show of hands. Everyone raise your hands. Yeah. 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 If your developer has a credit card, you probably have unauthorized cloud, or if they have a Dropbox account, right? right? Well, and does that constitute a breach? Well, hold on. When somebody let me starts running your cloud with data? Well, here's the issue, because what you lose is visibility and transparency. So the Amazon example is a perfect example. You may have already decommissioned that instance, and to you, that's gone, right? That's going to be re you know, recommissioned for somebody else. Data may or may not be resonant. You're probably not going to know about that, though. So the visibility to be able to detect the breach, which is just as important as anything that comes subsequent. But when you find out your data is on a cloud provider, is that a breach? Maybe, maybe. So on a related note, I mean, uh, so if you are if you fall under HIPAA slash high tech yeah. slash HIPAA two point whatever you want to call it, if you have a business associate who processes yeah. data for you, and what the definition of a business associate is is a little unclear in some cases, you are required to have that business associate sign an agreement that's saying that they will fully comply with HIPAA yep. and its associated requirements. Um, at one end of the spectrum, you have like the co-processor who actually takes your healthcare information and generates pretty charts and graphs or stores your data for you with some sort of e-health record system. That's clearly a business associate. At the other end of the spectrum, you have UPS. They're shipping your backup tapes. They are clearly not a business associate. So for the purposes of if you're a healthcare provider, you don't have to have UPS or FedEx or the US Postal Service sign that document. Amazon will not sign a business associates agreement with you. They flat refuse to do that. And their argument is, we are a carrier. Much like when you get a circuit from AT&T or Verizon or Sprint or anyone else, they're not signing the BAA because they're just a carrier. Just like UPS, just like FedEx. They have no insight into your data. And that is the argument. And plenty of organizations will agree with that interpretation. And as such, if you have healthcare related information on Amazon that gets breached in that situation, you are solely responsible for it. Amazon will say, not our problem. Okay, but if UPS loses that box, it's a breach. Right. If and Amazon you, can't account for your data. It's it's, right. Well, in that situation, you as the healthcare provider are the one who has to still owns responsibility. You have no ability to assign that blame to Amazon because they have not signed it yet. Yeah, essentially. They're carrying it. They have notified the people that we notified them whose data was there. I think they, they have a, us, they, they I think they have an or a a uh, an ethical responsibility and moral responsibility right. to notify them. But in terms of rules like HIPAA, they're just a carrier. They have no visibility into well, that. And they have no direct relationship with the consumer or the customer in this case. And the other thing is, is you know, the standard that we kind of accepted in my organization because I just pushed for it was, you know, you can transfer responsibility for many different things that you do with your business. You can't transfer accountability. So at right. the end of the day, what happens to that is going to fall on your shoulders. And to your point, most providers are not going to sign up for anything that holds them liable for any of this. And uh, you have to be very careful when you're talking about the cloud parts. Because um, uh, how many of you have done like a data flow analysis on, on cloud or, or understanding where geographies the data is going to go into, right? Or striping data across multiple data centers. I'm noticing not a lot of hands are shooting up. Um, and I think this goes back to a fundamental problem on breach detection, especially when dealing with cloud providers. Most people, we, we do a crappy job of inventory data. We do an even more crappy job of classifying data. And we, and we do the worst job of actually assigning controls based on where the data is going. You know, and, and most organizations just don't have a good handle on that, and it takes a while to get there, but until you do, you really don't have enough visibility, and, and the notification conversation is almost premature. All right, so two tough examples on that. Don't get me started on beating up Amazon, not since we brought it up. Anybody from Amazon in the room? Okay, good. Any Amazon partners? <laughs> but so one example is ITAR, right? So the United States has a regulation that says only U.S. citizens can touch this data at any time. Any other person who's not a U.S. citizen touching it, breach. So Amazon provided an ITAR compliant facility in their cloud by building a dedicated data center that was completely separate with only certain people had access to it at any one time. So does that show responsibility for breaches because they're providing a more secure service to comply with ITAR? 
Maybe. Uh, so if you want to use GovCloud, which is what you're talking about, yeah, yeah. you need to sign a really heavy-duty contract with Amazon mm -hmm. stating that uh, you will not allow any non-US citizen or green card, because green card folks are allowed in this, this situation as well, to have access to those systems or to any, or to those systems that are hosted on Amazon. You are not allowed to put anything rated higher than uh, FISMA medium, FISMA moderate rather, on those systems. And if you do put the confidential information or FISMA high or higher classified systems, you will bear the cost of destroying those systems and the replacement systems as well. So they are actually pushing back, Amazon's pushing that stuff back onto you as the consumer, guaranteeing that you will remain compliant with ITAR. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I don't think, I think it's less about Amazon taking responsibility for breaches and still being pushed back on the customer as much as just being able to sell to the company. You know, and it sounds very cynical, but that's really well, that's what you have to do. Yeah, right. but you're also seeing the niche now. I know there's like a layer tech or something like that. You're getting more of these compliant hosting providers that are to pop up. Terramark's doing that as well, where it's a we'll sign up for a subset of controls. Let's say PCI as a good example. We'll take responsibility for things that would traditionally be in your, your boat, but you're still ultimately accountable if we did something wrong. So, using the analogy of the UPS or the FedEx truck. You know, one of my favorite examples is the guy who pulled up for a Starbucks, went inside for a drink, came back out, and the tapes were missing. Is the carrier responsible? Is that a breach that the carrier has to take some responsibility for? Like, you would no longer use that carrier, right? Because right. you're stopping at Starbucks and leaving the doors unlocked. Or is that really the responsibility of the person buying the service? It's entirely their responsibility. The penalties are going to fall to the person who bought the service. They're really going to fall to the carrier who's the one that can pay. And again, this is a tapes are missing, not tapes were used. Right. So, but breach. That's going to depend on the contracts with the carrier. That's that's true. What the carrier is taking responsibility for. So, like, getting back to Amazon, because just because I know them well. Um, they are certified PCI compliant. All, what, the, what this means is you can potentially build an application that you can certify as PCI compliant right. on Amazon. You still need to be assessed and all that, but Amazon will give you a document that says, here are the physical security controls required by whatever six or seven, whatever the part, whichever, whatever, whichever the standard piece, subset of PCI are required. And we manage the portions of the patch management and configuration management of the hypervisor layer because PCI mandates that you secure the entire stack. Um, in that situation, if you have a breach and you can establish that it was a physical security breach or a hypervisor level issue that Amazon should have handled, you probably, you probably have an argument that Amazon has some responsibility there. Uh, but the reality is, is there's not been a single breach in the history of PCI where the PCI Council has said, you are PCI compliant at the time you were assessed. Right. At the time of your breach, and therefore, you're not uh, in trouble. Right. Every single breach that's happened, the PCI Council has declared that person not PCI compliant at the time well, of the breach. Well, and look at Heartland, right? You know, with the Heartland breach, I mean, right. the big thing was, was the, book, the pushback initially was always, well, our auditor said we were fine, you were PCI compliant, and of course that calls into question the actual, like, the, the skill set of the auditors who are doing the assessments and, and, and the education around that. So. Um, it is funny because even most of the, the organizations that, that do get breached and say they're PCI compliant, point, they aren't because they got breached. Well, isn't the point of the breach definition that to be breached, you're not compliant? Well, maybe. Well, yeah, because there are things that come outside that, like, you could have all the controls in the world. And there's always going to be the exceptions to that process. Go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying is that you could, I personally believe it's possibly compliant. Being compliant does not mean you're not vulnerable. Right. And that's, the, and the question, of course, the big argument is, were you sufficiently meeting the letter of the law? And if so, I mean, all PCI says, in the essence is, if you could, if you are compliant with all of these things, that then we cannot penalize you if you are breached. So it is very much in the PCI Council's best interest, financially, for you not to be compliant at the time of the breach. Well, is it really binary, or is it a sliding scale? So the more compliant you are, the lower the fines. Well, I, I, I'm not. I'm not. Who's a QSA? I would do a bit of either, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, it's, I think I it depends on, it depends on what the piece, I think it we depends on the who the council, who the QSA is, and yeah. what happened. And a PA QSA. But, but I also, Dave brings up a great point though, compliance doesn't equal security. Yeah, so we go back to, you know, Jack made a comment about, you know, people are just gonna do this based on good faith, right? You know, and, and, and I'm, I'm almost exploding on this side because it's so laughable. How, how many of you saw the California Attorney General trick? Okay, so 2.5 million breaches, which I think represents a little over 6% of the population of California, were exposed in 2012. 1.5, 1.4, so about 45% of those, in the Attorney General's opinion, but it's probably true, 
could have been averted by just using basic security controls like encryption of data and those kind of things. They're not counting wiretap, obviously. Right, they're not counting wiretap. <laughs> but, but that shows the level of, you know, concern and confidence and other things of some of these organizations. It's, it's not a complicated problem to avert a, a, a data incident. You know, we, we, we can fuzz it with APTs and all this other wonderful stuff out there. But in most cases, it just comes down to practice and common sense and having good security people and good assurance officers. And, and a lot of organizations fall short. The, the, the question I asked the CFPB. They're not there ignoring the cost. I mean, look at South Carolina. They had no, Texas, we had no idea how much that would have cost. Right. None. Okay. So, like when, CA, when, thir, when CA 1386 came out, I had this big meeting with our lawyers and we're discussing what, what do we need to do, what changes do we need to make? And the, question, the first question I asked is, what if we don't do anything? What is, you know, what is the cost to us? And with CA 1386, there's no financial penalties, zero at the time, yeah. for not being compliant if there was a breach. The answer, the only potential penalty is that the share, that there could be a class action lawsuit against us. Yeah. Um, and the fact is, before CA 1386, there could have been a class action lawsuit. All it did was give us safe harbor um, if things had been encrypted. And we were planning it anyway, so we did it. But one of the big questions you need to ask yourself as an organization is, what is the potential cost? You know, what's the risk to me of not being compliant versus the cost of maintaining compliance? Yeah. And that's a question a lot of organizations say, you know what? We're willing to pay the pen the fine. Okay. Which is why high tech rate jacked up the costs of fines. Because a lot of healthcare organizations like, max on fine, 50 grand. Cost of compliance, ten million dollars. Right. Well, yeah. that had since '97 to move on this dial, so. But I got still, another, I got another from South Carolina. Yeah. They just reported that they had a million people sign up for the uh, credit check at a cost of twelve million dollars for that alone. Yeah. That's that's the cost. Okay. Now I'm sorry, but you know what I can do with twelve million dollars? Yeah. And that's just the credit report. I have some stock in one of those credit reporting companies, so I'm really happy right now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be making a good investment. You, you know what's funny though? None of the states require credit monitoring to be part of the nation. No, but it's, it's political, the, in our perspective, and you know, it's my comfort yeah. or yeah. her name out of it, she's retiring, so it doesn't matter. It will never happen again if she's retiring. It's the reputation, it's the, it's the yeah. irrational behavior that occurred after that. And, and I, I agree with you, but I think what my point was is it's not required at a state level, but we're so readily doing it and costing millions of dollars to the organization where we would have done something with that money up front to protect the organization, to avoid the entire problem. So that's the other thing about that risk reward kind of culture, risk aversion, those kind of things. <coughs> if you don't have foresight into what it's actually going to do and impact your organization, if you're gonna pay for it at some point in time, but then you're gonna have a greater impact on other consumers and your customers and your brand. Right, so maybe, as maybe. much as this is, uh, you know, we're talking about our world here, it's not just InfoSec that has no. this issue. We take our shoes off going through the an airport every time because of an overreaction. You know, we're we're chasing symptoms. Yeah. It's like you said about UCLA. It's like we fired the guy. We fired the guy. We fired the guy. Or um, you know, the, the army focusing on Manning. It's like why the f did they have access? You know, my question was Snowden. Yeah, we can argue politics. That's fun to argue the politics and all that nonsense. But why did Snowden have access to what he had access to? Why did Manning have access to what he had access to? Why did, you know, the fundamentals? Well, we put Bradley in jail. We're safe. No, wait, no. The, the next kid did. Uh, no. <laughs> so that's one of the toughest questions. Let me ask you, please. In the security industry, we often see flaws and we don't think people are fixing them fast enough. Do we err on the side of trying to announce breaches, pointing to breaches? Do breaches help the security community to the point where we maybe overemphasize them? So, so here's the conundrum here. Most people in security aren't going to be the ones responsible for making the call on whether or not you actually announce the breach. You know, and, and it's going to be one of like 20 different factors that the organization's considering when they're, when they're making that determination. So from our perspective, it would be great if we had more visibility and transparency in the breaches that happen, the root cause analysis behind those, and, and we learn from those. You know, and the whole idea of like sharing information on the cybersecurity kind of infrastructure. And sort of when you say don't have control, you mean they don't actually, they're not involved in like, what authority? They have them. no authority to sign But they could leak information that would lead to a breach. And then they're going to be out of a job. And they're yeah, going to have to get and, But this is the thing. It's like the leaking of whistleblowers. And there. Most key people here want to stay employed. They probably have mortgages to pay and kids to feed. And, and there comes that fine line of, you know, I have my personal thoughts on, on when we should announce breaches. But ultimately, if the general counsel and the CEO says we're not going to announce it, 
I'm not going to announce it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to sleep well because I presented it, but I'm also going to have my job the next day. So it's, it's, it's a challenging spot for us. But are we secretly celebrating when we hear another brief report because it makes our case stronger? Yeah, yeah, really I don't, don't think we are anymore. Yeah. I think for a while, but now everybody's got fatigue. And yes. one of the things that we don't get out of the breach report is, um, forgive me for the phrase, actionable intelligence. Right? We're, we're just getting simple raw numbers. And uh, at first, that was kind of cool because it's it's like it's not quite as much of a stigma, stigma to get popped. It happens to everybody. Wow, it's depressing. It happens to everybody. Oh, look, another breach. And even where we get information, it's like, oh, a SQL injection, oh, a SQL injection, oh, a SQL. We're not getting the level of detail except from, you know, vendor reports. Yeah, like, granted, granted, DBIR is a lot more than a vendor report these days, but it's still, <clears throat> all this data is going out there and it's, you know, annoying some customers because they keep getting, you know, consumers are getting too much stuff. and. Well, it looks like, does it make us look bad? Does the security industry look like idiots because we have so many breaches? Oh, we, we don't need any help there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I love what you're saying because this is something that really, like, this is my, my, my thing. We are just, the average person in this room, I'll bet you can ask 50% of the people, they have had stuff that they wanted to report, but they were not allowed to. Why I live in the state That is a huge problem. All right, we know right what's going on. So, so to derail this to a topic that's near and dear to my heart and has been around here, that frustration is part of the burnout in this industry too. The shit we know they can't say. I mean, I didn't take it. I'll talk about Texas all day long. I won't take it. I'm gonna go get happy at my job, and I'm not gonna expect to make me happy. I'm yeah, but, not gonna but, yeah, some but, stupid decision. But your personality disorders skew in a different direction <laughs> than most personality disorders in our industry. Yeah. But look at TGX. We've had this conversation. They, they released coupons, realized their stock went up because of that, and didn't fix anything in theory. So, I mean, TJ, yeah, and having been from Texas and, and having been, I don't mean from Massachusetts, having had TJX uh, headhunters attempt to recruit me repeatedly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing they, they, uh, they, they rolled out the, the lipstick and, you know, they put it on both ends of the pig uh, and it kind of worked. <laughs> That's true. I mean, retail in general, when they have problems, they run a sale, right? Everybody comes back. But it works. <laughs> it does work. But it can't work for every industry. No. I think, I think it goes to show that people have a very short half-life with uh, their information getting breached, especially since they realize from a credit card perspective, it has almost no impact again. And so I, I feel like we're, we're putting too much focus on the wrong thing and we're constrained by the laws. It's great. It used to be great when we found out there was a data breach because it allowed us to get resources. Now, you know, our executives have already heard this. So we've all had data breaches, so it doesn't really help. If anything, it, it leads to us focusing on protecting the wrong kind of data, in my opinion. So actually, a, a couple of things that, are, that, that have been, I found really interesting. One is that in the retail space, the organization needs to suffer three breaches before they have significant turnover. So actually, Despite the publicity, so from you know, when I'm working with a client that's in the retail industry, I encourage them to report because people are like, okay, they're human. That happens. Surely they fix the problem, right. and then they go back until the third time. Um, the other interesting thing so is when you start, rule. yeah, pretty much. Um, the other cool thing is that when you start looking at, like, you start start talking to folks like um, Debex, I forget what they rebrand themselves, uh, and folks like these credit monitoring folks who help. Um, one of the things they found is the larger the breach of like credit card information, the, the less likely it is that your information is going to be used. So I don't really worry about those big breaches where they say 500,000 or 2 million credit cards were stolen. Like, whatever it happens to be. Um, yeah, um, it just doesn't matter. That's the, yeah, what yeah, our six, six cards stolen, they're, all of them are used within minutes. Right, right. that's what we have to worry about. It. Um, the other thing is that well, if you look at high tech, you said 500, right? Is the breach watermark. I think that's 500 records. Um, but the other thing is that, uh, I think anything less than 500 is probably targeted at attack personally, um, is that the cost, the value of a stolen credit card on the black market used to be hundreds of dollars, and now it's like a buck, 98 cents, something that's really, really low. And so if anything, all these breaches have been really good because the market view, the black market, by the people who are gonna use these maliciously at any sort of scale, is they're not worth anything. Right. You're not suggesting we should look at the economic impacts and ramifications of the decisions we make. Or, you know, 
desert. I don't think we're, I, we don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's our last question. I think this is going to be in, in, insightful or inciting. So We keep uh, talking about how we're going to keep band-aiding all the problems that are out there. What about fixing all the underlying issues? I mean, like, hey, let's go all the way down. There's to good the money to be there made in selling uh, surgical tape. No, Stop that's, it. that's fine. Right there. <laughs> but then there's the whole psychological stack that goes on top of that from, you know, you've got a network, and oh, it's, it's my secure internal network, and then your sysadmins act a certain way because it's the internal network. It's not on the end. It's not in the DMC or out on the public side. And then you have people that are writing code that goes on top of those servers, and they're going, no, that's a secure internal network, so I don't have to worry about this stuff. And so you have all these layers of like this extra psychology that's going on top of it that if you maybe eliminate some of those really, really low level. But the database like, is encrypted. But, but except no, when you're like, using the, it. like my Nagios, not it's mine easy. personally, but right. whoever had the idea that my Nagio server didn't need HTTPS to log into the web interface because mm -hmm. it's on the intranet and then came to a security con and has credentials on the other side of that firewall right there on the Doppler box yep. uh, because they VPN or they didn't VPN they're, they're open it to the internet probably hey just so I can do a little admin log on right <laughs> one comment to build on because I just recently had an argument with a developer no um, I'm I mean, shocked <laughs> it happens and unfortunately I got enough technical knowledge to make myself dangerous but you know the comment was you know I'm working on an on-premise application so if I'm going to deploy this application I'm not worried about security because that's the customer's responsibility because it's going to be inside their firewalls on the internet wow. we had a long talk after that and, and I still think it goes down to the best way to prevent breaches in most organizations and getting back to what data do you focus on is awareness and education and training and understanding, you know, a security architecture that makes sense and resonates. And it's not just the perimeter and, and all these other things. You know, there's at least six logical layers in a security model. That's Get people to start so thinking fun. about that and building it out. Um, we just don't do enough of that. So we have people that just continue creating problems for the organization and they just don't know anything. It, it, is it awareness or is it a stick? So in, in a lot of organizations, you're told it's against the rules to leave your laptop unattended and log in or leave it in your car. I know people work in organizations where they're clearly told if you do that, you're terminated. And those types of incidents rarely occur in those types of organizations. It's the awareness of the state. Yeah. The awareness of the state. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not really a question, just to add on, I think somebody who often plays a role, I always think of it like we're always compromised. How do I do well, so that's a point, the last point that I want to make here is a lot of this is um, getting back to root causes. If any of you mug me in the chill out room later, you will not be able to take $2,000 in cash from me because I am not carrying $2,000 in cash. 5000 uh, no. <laughs> Um, four nights in a row, I put it, uh, it, yeah, it's in my socks. Uh, four <laughs> nights in a row, Frankie's, um, you know, dwindling on the cash thing. Uh, but if, well, as a contrarian, if we I don't have, we can't lose issue. what we don't have. So True. we store. But to the point that they're making, the question is, if we define everything as breached, we're always breached, what is the definition of a breach? Well, no, there's nothing, there's well, nothing compromised. Right. Compromised. Yeah. The, the, the perimeter is alive. All right, so we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.